This is a mechanism of disease map on hypertension and the complications of hypertension. I'll be talking about the etiologies of hypertension, as well as the pathophysiology and the many manifestations, both the symptoms of hypertension directly, the kind of chronic long-term sequela of hypertension, as well as the acute symptoms of hypertensive emergency and how that might present as end organ failure. As in all of these flowcharts, the boxes are color-coded according to these concepts up here, and I'll be clearing all of these bubbles and talking through them one by one. So let's get started. First, let's begin with kind of the definition of blood pressure, as well as how we derive that definition, and that kind of explains the pathophysiology here. So blood pressure can be defined as cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. And there are a few definitions for blood pressure, depending on the guidelines that you're following. The one that I've most commonly seen is a blood pressure above 130 systolic and, uh, and or above 80 diastolic. And um, that seems to be a pretty good definition for class one hypertension. There's also class two hypertension, which would be above 140 and or above 190. Now, what do these words mean? Cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. SVR, systemic vascular resistance, is essentially the resistance in all of your arteries in your systemic circulation. So it's a measure of how clamped down your arteries are or how hard it is to push blood forward in your systemic circulation. Cardiac output is essentially how much blood your, your heart pumps out per unit of time. And that can be computed with heart rate and with stroke volume. HR is heart rate and stroke volume, um, is how much your heart pumps out with one beat, with one stroke. And um, it makes sense that if any of these numbers are high, then the subsequent product will be high, and the final subsequent product is blood pressure. So increasing <coughs> any of these metrics can increase your blood pressure. And we'll be talking about all the etiologies, some of which tie directly to one of these factors, and some have a difficult etiology that we don't necessarily understand, and we'll just tie it to high blood pressure as a whole. So let's think about etiologies. I'll break these down first into modifiable and non-modifiable etiologies. So for the non-modifiable etiologies, if you have a family history of hypertension, you'll be predisposed to having hypertension. And I imagine there are multiple mechanisms through which this happens, so we'll just point it to the large box here. There are some races and ethnicities that are predisposed to having hypertension, and that's again multifactorial. It's a big social determinant of health, so we'll point it to this big box here as well. Advanced age can predispose you to hypertension, and that's usually thought to be through arterial stiffening. And if you have stiff arterioles, it'll be difficult to, uh, to pump blood through your vascular system, and you'll have an increased systemic vascular resistance. So that's how advanced age might contribute to arterial stiffening. Next are the modifiable risk factors, and there are a few more here. Uncontrolled type 2 diabetes is when your body has too much insulin <clears throat> and insulin resistance. So high insulin, um, it's, it's, a, it's a hormone in your body, and it has many, many effects. The ones that are relevant to hypertension are first proliferation of vascular muscle cells. This again makes your um, arterioles kind of thicker, and they kind of close in the arterial lumen, so they can increase your systemic vascular resistance and contribute to high blood pressure that way. In addition, high insulin also increases your intravascular volume. It essentially increases the volume of blood that you have. And when you have more blood, your body is going to pump more blood with each heartbeat. So you'll increase your stroke volume by increasing your intravascular volume. And that also contributes to high blood pressure, of course, as we said. Having this kind of diet with high sodium and low potassium also increases your intravascular volume. Remember that in your kidneys, when you're filtering out um, fluids and salts, water tends to follow sodium. So if you have a lot of sodium in your body, it's gonna take a while for your kidneys to clear that sodium. And while that sodium is in your body, that water associated with the sodium, the water that follows the, uh, the, the sodium will also be in your body. And that increases your intravascular volume, which again, contributes to your high stroke volume which can downstream lead to high blood pressure. Smoking has a bit of a different pathophysiology. Smoking releases nicotine, which stimulates your sympathetic nervous system. Your sympathetic nervous system includes hormones like adrenaline and noradrenaline, also called epinephrine and norepinephrine, and those can directly increase your heart rate and your systemic vascular resistance. Those, um, those hormones do many things in the body, among which they make your heart beat a little faster and they make your arteries kind of clamp down and tighten, thus increasing your systemic vascular resistance.
Psychological stress can also do this, increasing your sympathetic nervous system. And you might have experienced this, maybe during a panic attack or just an anxious or um, fight or flight period where you feel your heart beat a little bit faster. That can increase your blood pressure. And when it, when it happens kind of intermittently, it's not that big of a deal, but if it happens chronically, if you always have psychological stress and increased sympathetic nervous system, it can contribute to chronic high blood pressure. Excessive alcohol has a different uh, patho pathophysiology here. Excessive alcohol does many things. One of the more prominent is increasing your renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. And this is a cascade of hormones that affects your kidneys and affects how much fluid your body retains through your kidneys. So that'll increase your stroke volume, much like intravascular volume increased your stroke volume. In fact, I probably could have drawn an arrow from increased renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system to uh, in high, in increased intravascular volume as well. And actually increasing your sympathetic nervous system also increases the RAS. So it, it, it'll become clear that all of these things are very interconnected. Obesity, being overweight, and having a sedentary lifestyle, again, multifactorial, some of which is known, some of which is not known. So I'll just point the arrow to high blood pressure as a whole here. So everything I've talked about so far contributes to what we call primary hypertension. It's hypertension that's caused by these risk factors and not another underlying medical illness. Um, next, I'll talk about the causes of secondary hypertension, but it's important to differentiate these in your head. These are generally associated with non-modifiable risk factors, essentially bad luck here, but then also kind of metabolic syndrome um, lifestyle stuff here. And um, these, so primary hypertension is gonna be different from secondary hypertension. And um, we'll, see, we'll see the differences in a second. <clears throat> One cause of secondary hypertension is aortic coarctation. This is a narrowing of your aorta, which can in significantly increase your systemic vascular resistance. So that can directly cause an increase in SVR. You can also have renovascular disease. This is a disease of the arteries going to the kidneys. And because those arteries will be kind of clamped down, the, the, um, the lumen will be narrowed, that'll increase your renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. There are a few ways to get renovascular disease. In older men, it tends to be renal artery stenosis, RAS. In younger women, it tends to be fibromuscular dysplasia, which is kind of an inflammatory disorder that causes a buildup of the arterial walls, whereas renal, uh, renal, renal artery artery stenosis is more of a atherosclerotic pathophysiology. But in any case, your arteries going to your kidneys are narrowing and you'll increase ROS and increase the blood pressure through that mechanism. Another way to increase the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is with a tumor, like in primary aldosteronism. There, this is also called Kahn syndrome, but it's essentially a tumor in your body that produces um, aldosterone, which of course will stimulate the rest of this pathway. Another tumor that this time stimulates the sympathetic nervous system is a pheochromocytoma. This is something that produces a lot of epinephrine and norepinephrine, and you'll see the downstream effects of increasing blood pressure with a pheochromocytoma as well. You can also stimulate your sympathetic nervous system with drugs and um, some medicines, some drugs. These are some drugs that are uppers, essentially, amphetamines, cocaine, PCP, caffeine, and nicotine can all increase your blood pressure. Obstructive sleep apnea has a uh, general effect on blood pressure. I'm pointing it to the big box here. It has something to do with hypoxia overnight that uh, leads your heart to work a little harder and increases your blood pressure that way, probably with some arterial stiffening as well. And again, to show how interrelated these things, obesity can of course contribute to obstructive sleep apnea, which can contribute to high blood pressure. Cushing syndrome is another that has multifactorial effect. Cushing syndrome is when you have very high cortisol or steroids in your body. Some of that can be iatrogenic if it was given as a medicine. Um, it could be um, neoplastic as well if you have a cortisol producing tumor. Acromegaly is a problem in the body where you have too much growth hormone. That one also increases blood pressure. Hyperthyroidism and hyperparathyroidism are uh, other hormones that can be high that can increase your blood pressure as well. And again, these can all be tumors throughout the body, pituitary tumors for some of them, or parathyroid tumors, or thyroid tumors for the others. And the mechanisms for these, uh, acromegaly and Cushing syndrome, are kind of similar to insulin. They both have uh, growth hormone and steroids, both have 
effects in the body that are similar to insulin. So I suspect there's some component that's similar to increased intravascular volume and proliferation of vascular muscle cells. Now let's get into the manifestations. Before we begin, if you have chronic blood pressure, it's important to note that you don't necessarily have symptoms. High blood pressure is sometimes called uh, the silent killer, and that's because in many people, until it becomes disastrous, it might be asymptomatic. So I wanted to highlight that before we fill in this whole area with a bunch of outcomes and manifestations of high blood pressure. That being said, you can have symptoms from high blood pressure. These are listed here. Um, headaches are uh, not super common, but when they do happen, patients tend to report they're in the early mornings. They might be when the patient is walking, and um, some, so these nocturnal headaches um, or early morning headaches can be in the back of the head as well. Um, that's how they describe headaches that are a result of hypertension. Patient might have nervousness, might have sleep disturbances. I've put nervousness twice. Um, they can have flushed appearance. They might have bounding pulses on physical exams. They might have epistaxis or nosebleeds. Of course, high blood pressure will be harder to clot. The, um, the flowing blood can cause nosebleeds. They can have tinnitus or ringing in the ears. They can have blurred vision or dizziness as well. Now, this is kind of the um, short-term effects of high blood pressure, of chronic blood pressure. When you have high blood pressure for a long time, you'll have many chronic effects, and I'll talk about those next. So high blood pressure, of course, affects your cardiovascular system. If it's really bad, it can cause an aortic dissection um, after chronic blood pressure uh, for uh, a long time can cause weakening of your aorta and eventually lead to a dissection. This might present as chest pain or asymmetric pulses. And I think blood pressure is actually the most common, um, the, the most common etiology of aortic dissection. They can also cause aortic aneurysm, which can be asymptomatic, but might present as uh, pain in the abdomen or in the chest. Atrial fibrillation can result from high blood pressure, and high blood pressure over a long time can cause heart failure as well. Now there are a couple features of heart failure that are worth knowing. You can have left ventricular hypertrophy, and you can have cardiomyopathy, either hypertrophic or dilated cardiomyopathy. And again, to point out how all of these are very related in cardiology, um, hypertrophy of the left ventricle and cardiomyopathy can also predispose you to atrial fibrillation. You can also have symptoms of heart failure. This includes pulmonary edema, you can have dyspnea or um, shortness of breath, and you can have crackles on your lung exam. High blood pressure can also predispose you to atherosclerosis and general artery disease throughout the body. When this affects your coronary arteries, you can have a heart attack, a myocardial infarction. That, of course, can present with chest pain or sweating or diaphoresis. This can also cause artery disease throughout the rest of the body. So in your peripheral arteries, such as your legs, you can have peripheral artery disease, and this might cause a leg claudication or leg pain when you start walking. You can also have carotid artery disease. These are the arteries that go up to your brain, and that can predispose you to stroke. High blood pressure itself can predispose you to stroke or transient ischemic attacks. Um, these can be hemorrhagic strokes or ischemic strokes. And if you have a lot of TIAs, if you have a lot of strokes over time, you might even have a vascular dementia. This is kind of a stepwise decline in your cognitive function. Um, thought to be caused by several mini strokes, usually with a vascular or blood pressure etiology. So it's a, it's a type of dementia that's associated with bad arteries, with atherosclerosis um, throughout the body. And of course, carotid artery stenosis can also cause strokes, TIAs, and over time vascular dementia. The main symptoms for strokes and TIAs are focal neurologic deficits and altered mental status. So a patient with high blood pressure for a very long time might present with that, and you'll have to deduce that there was likely a stroke or a transient ischemic attack. The high blood pressure over time, of course, affects your arteries um, going to your kidneys this time. So you can have hypertrophic arteries going to your kidneys where you have medial and intimal thickening. Um, these are the two layers, the two inner layers of your arteries. This again causes a arterial narrowing, as we mentioned when we talked about increasing your systemic vascular resistance. And when going to your kidneys in particular, this will lead to a low glomerular blood flow. In a very acute case, this can cause an acute kidney injury, but over time, it might still cause ischemia, fibrosis, which can lead to chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease. Last or one of the last organ systems that can be affected are the eyes. This is called hypertensive retinopathy. Your eyes, your, the blood vessels going up to your eyes will essentially have a, vaso, a reactive vasoconstriction. So they'll be getting so much blood so fast, so much fluid, that their response is to vasoconstrict. This can cause sclerosis and breakdown of the blood retinal barrier, which can present with hemorrhage and exudation. So the symptoms you might see from this are blurred vision, 
decreased visual acuity, retinal hemorrhages, again, that's from the sclerosis and breakdown of the blood retinal barrier, and papilledema on your eye exam. Now, this is kind of, I, most of this, of, of, of what I've discussed, is from chronic high blood pressure. In a more acute case, you can have a hypertensive emergency, which is defined as when your blood pressure is very high, above 180 over 120, and you also have end organ damage. So this is more of an acute presentation of hypertension, whereas most of these were kind of a chronic, um, long-standing hypertensive um, product. So hypertensive emergencies, there are a couple other things that contribute to a hypertensive emergency. I'll list those here. One is medication non-adherence. This is a patient who probably has two or three medicines to control their chronic high blood pressure, but if they stop taking them, or if they can't afford them, or if they can't get their medicines for some other reason, that can predispose them to a hypertensive emergency. There are some medications that increase your blood pressure, and you want to be careful when prescribing these to somebody who has chronic hypertension. This includes tricyclic antidepressants, NSAIDs like ibuprofen or naproxen can precipitate a hypertensive emergency, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. These are tyramine-containing drugs that are sometimes used for depression. They're kind of old drugs, but um, they're especially bad when you mix them with tyramine-containing foods, so that can cause a tyramine hypertensive crisis, also called a monoamine oxidase uh, inhibitor hypertensive crisis. And if you mix them with SSRIs, which are another drug used for depression, you can actually have a serotonin syndrome. Um, which might also present with high blood pressure and have some of these symptoms. Some people have many causes of secondary hypertension that also predispose them to hypertensive emergency, so sometimes that's going on in the background as well. If the patient's pregnant, they might have preeclampsia or eclampsia, and that can also contribute to a hypertensive emergency. And of course, trauma to the head or to the spinal cord can mess up your body's auto-regulation of blood pressure and predispose you to a hypertensive emergency as well. Now, many of the presentations of hypertensive emergency, many of the end organ damage symptoms are similar to the ones that you would see um, in, in chronic hypertension over a long time. So we'll go through those again. You can have aortic dissection from hypertensive emergency. So if a patient has a very high blood pressure and all of a sudden has chest pain and asymmetric pulses, suspect aortic dissection. You can have heart failure, and this is where the flash pulmonary edema comes in. Um, if all of a sudden you have a new pulmonary edema and the patient otherwise didn't have heart failure for a long time, um, they might be in a hypertensive emergency. That would count as end organ damage for the heart. Um, myocardial infarction can, of course, result from hypertensive emergency. If your body is pumping blood that fast, of course, your heart's going to get exhausted. So if a patient has chest pain and diaphoresis um, with a very high blood pressure, suspect a myocardial infarction. This can also predispose to strokes. This might be more common for hemorrhagic strokes. If you have a really, really high blood pressure going up to your brain, it'll be harder to clot and it might bleed into your brain. So again, these symptoms are relevant here. Also related to the brain, if your brain is not able to decrease the blood flow to the brain and you have so much blood because you're so hypertensive, over 180, um, over 120 diastolic, your brain might not be able to regulate itself. It might not be able to decrease that blood flow. So you'll have vasodilation in the vessels going up to the brain and the brain will be hyperperfused. This can cause cerebral edema, which is kind of similar to a stroke. You'll have neurologic symptoms, but the pathophysiology is a little bit different. You can have headache, confusion, seizures, and vomiting. And that would also be considered end organ damage in the case of hypertensive emergency. Going back here, um, hypertensive emergency can again affect your kidneys. This is where the AKI might come in, whereas the chronic process might lead to end-stage renal disease. An acute hypertensive crisis might lead to um, acute kidney injury. Of course, you can affect your eyes, just like before, have these same symptoms in hypertensive retinopathy. And now, actually lastly, you can have an anemia from hypertensive emergency. When you're pumping blood so fast through your uh, vasculature, that blood might not be um, very stable. It might not flow so smoothly. It might become turbulent, and that can cause a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So the patient might have anemia symptoms like fatigue and pallor as they're kind of shearing their red blood cells as it's pumped very quickly through the vasculature. Now, one last thing to note, you can also have hypertensive urgency. That's when you meet this level of blood pressure without the end organ damage. So if you don't have any of these symptoms, if you don't have any signs of end organ damage, that might be hypertensive urgency. But I've labeled this as hypertensive emergency because of all the downstream possible effects on the many organs.
So this has been kind of a long video, uh, a long flowchart on hypertension and its complications. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.